Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi, and this is Richard Cohen. Hello, everyone. Hooray. Finally getting back to recording. I've been on such a such a break. Um, and so thank you to the to listeners who are still looking for the show, even though it hasn't been out consistently this summer. Um, so Richard and I are going to talk about hopefully some some lesson planning things, some developmental objective things, some assessment things. Wait, I thought we were talking about Netflix shows. <laughs> that, are we really okay i can yeah i mean you know how the show goes i read the quote and then the conversation goes wherever it wants There's a so quote? i can read i can read the quote here in this case two paragraphs indeed and then we can still end up talking about netflix shows but we'll no. see okay so we're going to start with this from um the book the great disconnect in early childhood education what we know versus what we do by michael gramling which i highly recommend um, maybe more than any of the other books you hear me talk about on the show, this one I've gone back to and back to and back to. I was just telling you about this book that uh, that uh, keeps drawing you back because I think it acknowledges the reality that I've experienced working in child care programs in early childhood. I think a lot of other books, even books that I love, still have a very idealized idea of what's really happening in early childhood spaces right. and and Michael Gramling in this book does a really good job pointing out what we know and then what we actually do and talking about the, mm. the disconnect as it says in the title but also like how we could do it differently um and so it's not one that people will be like oh that's that's great in theory but it's one that people will read and recognize themselves at least <laughs> a few times right. as they're reading it um plug for this book I love it. <laughs> I can tell. We can tell. Also, I haven't recorded for a while, so I'm a little bit weirdly excited about You don't even speak about passionately this. about your husband, so <laughs> my goodness. Why don't you marry the book? Oh, my God. Well, listen, you're lucky I'm recording with you because my husband and I are in the house together alone for the first time in two years. So, Girl, your priorities are out of whack. <laughs> He's very busy doing his hobby things right now. So I'm doing my hobby thing. Okay. Okay. So anyway, here's here's our starting point. Bear with me. It is longer than usual, but I think we need to get this whole section in for our conversation. So Gramling writes, what we have here is yet another extraordinary disconnect between what we know and what we do. We understand in theory that the developmental chasm between four-year-old and five-year-old is deep and wide and cannot be crossed simply by writing lesson plans and objectives that try to will children into maturity but we act as if all preschool programs have no value to children other than providing a dress rehearsal for real school. Um, and, and I'm going to skip. Yeah. So then there's some discussion of specific, a couple of specific programs um, and it's some talk about policymakers. Um, uh, but anyway, so then it goes on, he goes on to say all of their programs, they would point out they being the policymakers are instructed to provide services that are developmentally appropriate. But it is a mixed message indeed when these same programs are instructed to use assessments that identify unmet developmental goals as deficits, and when these same programs are required to demonstrate progress in achieving those goals. Um, and I, 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 you know, I named the three things that, that you and I discussed before I hit record that I thought we'd really hit on um, but assessment is one of the big pieces that I wanted to find something that could guide some conversation about that, because that's one that as a professor, I'm struggling with. You know, I have all these um, checklists and, and milestone marker kinds of things that I'm supposed to be using with um, with teachers when I talk about assessment but I, or with students. But I feel like assessment is so much bigger than than just that list. So. Um, so, OK, Richard, what do you think? Well, let me just clarify. When you said the three things, you mm -hmm. mean uh, lesson planning? Yes. What are the three things? Objectives, lesson planning, objectives for children, to like developmental objectives, and assessing children, assessing development. So I guess one thing I would say to start to just put those three things into a context that um, I'm sure we're all familiar with, um, and that is the cycle of curricular planning. Mm -hmm. Right. It's that 
never ending perpetual cycle that we early childhood professionals are always looping through. There's no one start and no one end, but to just randomly pick a place, we um, observe our children, we assess where they're at and create, I would say then create objectives out of that. Mm -hmm. Then we plan our lessons quote unquote lessons, it's a horrible term, yes. but okay. We plan what we're all gonna do together, what opportunities they'll have, let's say. And then we go implement it. And then we observe how that goes, assess how that went. And then the whole cycle starts all over again. Mm -hmm. So this quote, you know, feels really important to me because it really, um, you know, it, it speaks to it speaks to the cycle that we're all in all the time and some don't explicitly realize it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the, the observation piece of that cycle, I think is often left out. Like, I, I don't think that a lot of early childhood uh, practitioners are particularly trained and equipped or have time to really do that observation piece well. And time maybe is the biggest thing. And I, I feel like they're given, you know, a list of objectives or a list of milestone events develop that, that children go through developmentally and then they plan for them and that's it. Like, I, I, I think what you're describing would be a, a really great way to be planning. But I think just the way that our systems are set up um, what you're talking about is really individualizing. And I think what happens most often is, is what, what he described in the first part of that, that quote, where we feel like we can just get a good lesson plan and four-year-olds will be five-year-olds. Um, and, and it's very much focused on standard, seeing children as a standardized group and not, um, you know, seeing where they each are. We, we could do some observation, look at that developmental outcome chart or whatever, and see which children might want, need, you know, what we might need some practice, or we could, you know, plan something that would give them opportunities to practice something we see that they're working on. But I, I don't think that we have the setup to do that. And with the disparity in qualifications and, and experience and program expectations, um, it's, it's hard for, for a teacher to really go in and say, I want to do this authentically and, and set it up the way you described. You know, I feel like you don't even need me here. You just said all that <laughs> so perfectly. You should just be monologuing this and I'll just nod. Okay. Um, talk while I, I take mean, a drink at least. Okay. Um, that's what I do with my with my college students or in a workshop. If no one answers when I ask a question, I'm just like, I'm casually taking a yep. seat now, waiting for someone to answer. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah. So especially I, I when I'm, I'm teaching a Zoom class, class and I see what I doing. really have it. Yeah. Yeah. You were manipulating me. And sure. Thank you. It's one of the um, skills I got from my mother. <laughs> um. Well, that's a whole other podcast, right? Um. So. Yeah, you know, where my mind went to, well, first of all, I agree with everything you just said with your assessment oh, thank you. of all the reasons why we're so challenged <laughs> yeah. as a field to do, to quote unquote, do curriculum in the way that that I had sort of suggested was the a natural cycle. Mm -hmm. um, and you also use the term individualizing, mm -hmm. which is really important to the field and to you and I. And to me, I just feel like we overcomplicate things. Uh, you know, if we just had plenty of time for free play and lots of open-ended materials and equipment and we knew how to facilitate them, mm -hmm. um, then it all just happens and things become individualized because each child approaches that material from their own place of development and we're just there to scaffold them to whatever's next for them. Mm -hmm. And observe and make some notes about wherever they are without judgment and that cycle just happens mm -hmm. but what i think i hear you saying is that what stands in front of it what stands between us and what to me seems like such a natural process 
um, are all of the external expectations mm -hmm. and requirements that keep us distracted and nervous and stressed about what we're supposed to be doing rather than just allowing what's natural to happen and trusting that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, think about that smarty pants. <laughs> Sorry, I was just starting to write notes in case you were going to keep talking. So I would remember what I was going to say. I, saw um, I mean, I think that that idea of outside expectations is big. And I think that is a lot of what contributes to the disconnect between what we know and what we do is that we're not all comfortable or feel safe enough to say to someone from the outside who has some kind of power over our programming, um, I'm not going to do it that way. And here's why, or, okay, those are good expectations you have, but I think I can do it. I think I can still get there in this, you know, much more relaxed play-based, um, child-led, uh, uh, you know, curious teacher kind of kind of path right. um and we just don't all or or and sometimes we don't have the opportunity to do that like, like how often could I really have that conversation with someone in power over me but um uh I, I think we have to start getting comfortable doing that in little ways when we can instead of just saying well that's what we're expected to do you know I hear that all the time when I'm doing like workshops or when students in my classes are already working in early childhood programs, right? is that, um, well, they won't let me do that. So we, we can't just be passive about that and say, yeah, okay. But, but that's where the disconnect comes in is when we, we don't see a path to advocate for what we, what we know. And so what we do is what we're told to do. I don't know. I, Right. And I, I don't mean that that probably sounds really critical of, of teachers and in, in early, early childhood folks. I don't mean it that way. I just, I, I think we don't all have that comfort level of saying, um, you know, what you're describing to me sounds like you think all children are on the same level and one magic activity will get them to this goal. Right. Um, uh, but I, you know, my, my experience and what I've learned says that it's much more effective to individualize and it's easier to individualize if we're not expecting everybody to do the same activities in the same groups all day and on the this very tight schedule. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, you know, there's so many directions we could go in this conversation mm -hmm. because what the, 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 the actuality that I just heard you describing has so many contributing factors, right? right? There is the, there is the lack of educated, uh, of early childhood educated people in our mm -hmm. field. Um, there's the pay that, that attracts that kind of lovely human being who is lovely with children, but doesn't have all that theoretical or, mm -hmm. or skill-based knowledge. Mm -hmm. and so they're just doing what they're told. You know, it was either make $12 at ABC preschool or, you know, I can make about the same at big lots, um, you know, when I'm working the register. Mm -hmm. And so as long as we have a field that is held that way by our society, this, what we've just been, what you described, what we're talking about will be challenge will always be challenging for those masses <clears throat> doing this work. Um, mm -hmm. And there'll always be a disconnect, you know, as you know, Heather, I spent this morning trying to wrap my brain around NAEYC accreditation. Mm -hmm. And in our world of community colleges, it's a higher ed accreditation. Mm -hmm. But so many of your listeners, at least in America anyway, have to contend with NAEYC's accreditation of early childhood programs. Right. All those expectations all the word salad that goes into making them up that nobody really can apply to their real life experiences mm -hmm. with the children in front of them. Bosses who sometimes know less than the teachers. Licensing requirements that, uh, that you know, that disempowered people, mm -hmm. teachers, directors, et cetera, um, who are all driven by, you know, 
We've got to keep parents enrolled. We've got to keep this program financially stable. We've got to do these things. We don't have time to question whether NAEYC or licensing or state standards are appropriate or not. We just we just got to keep doing them. Mm-hmm. We'll keep those kids alive, you know, till the end of each day mm-hmm. um, so that we can keep this program afloat. Yeah. As a former director, you know, it was, there were so many times that it would have been easy to fall into that into that fear-based way of thinking Mm -hmm. because those are all the contextual, those are some, many of the contextual pieces that surround a person's ability to do what you described and what's alluded to in the quote. Yeah. I think about, um, I think, and I think this ties, ties us into the sort of developmental outcomes piece of the conversation too. Um, because um, people, some people only value what they can measure neatly, what can be a tidy little um, report at the end of the week or whatever. And it reminds me of a time when I was working with one-year-olds um, in a child care center and I had one-year-olds, but then I also had some young twos who were waiting for there to be space in the next room for them to move into. Um, But we were very much expected to plan group group activities. And um, Indiana has, um, it's called the Indiana Early Learning Foundations and it's our state standards. And um, they're, they're, I think they're good. They're good for a guiding tool Um, It basically lists, you know, by different ages, what kinds of things they need practice with for whatever content area that is. So they're good if you use them um, appropriately, I guess. But anyway, we were expected to put on our weekly lesson plan form. This is the foundation we're working on and plan one activity, a different one each day, because if we repeat, we're going to get bored. (laughs) (laughs) I was always written up for, Um, but each day a different group activity that's going to get them to the next age group's foundational skill in that area. And, and then like somehow measure by, by observing whether kids have gotten that. And to think that this 13 month old and this 25 month old could be standardized by a group activity that we do once because it's on the lesson plan, right? You know that in that used developmental outcomes, that used curriculum planning, whatever. But it wasn't reality; like it was performative. Right. And I think that we all, many of us, get stuck in that because we have to be able to prove that what we're doing is effective. And so, I guess what I'm what I'm what I'm saying on this topic in this episode is we have to find ways to break away from that and make it the value that is happening through our philosophies. Um, We have to find ways to make that visible in small chunks because we're not going to get them to come to class. We're not going to get some of those outside outside expectors um, to come to a workshop or a meeting. Um, We have to find these bite-sized ways of of making it um, appropriate and visible. Right to move some folks past this, but we have to understand it first ourselves to be able to do that. Yes. So to do that, let's, let's point out at least two fallacies that I heard in what you said in, in the beginning of your speaking, you know, these already, but just for your listeners who may not. Right? Sure. So first of all, one, you know, and when I say fallacies, I mean, these are things that so many of us in the field, um, um, believe they know and do because they've not questioned it mm-hmm. or don't have the time to speak against it, um, even though science tells us otherwise. Mm-hmm. Scads of research by 2022. So one of them is that an activity can get a child somewhere. <laughs> and an activity is the mechanism to um, move a child's development. Mm-hmm. Right. That was one thing that I heard that I heard you say that you had heard other people say, right? If you just do this activity, then it'll help the child learn that 
developmental skill or meet that standard. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's a fallacy. We know that that's not at all how development works. Right. Right. And the second thing is that you said, um, and again, I know, you know, <laughs> is um, the belief that repetition is bad. Right. When all science tells us that repetition is exactly what uh, young children need mm -hmm. and that if we just listen to them, um, we will hear them desiring repetition. Mm -hmm. And so if we're trying to come up with new activities, it we may think that that looks good to outsiders. Right. But it's like, you know, would you go to the dentist and he said, I've come up with this new way of brushing your teeth with your finger. And, um, <laughs> you know, I really think it's going to work. I saw an article on Pinterest about it. <laughs> the dentist going to Pinterest. <laughs> National Tooth Daily Magazine or something. Yeah. And you'd be like, no, science pretty much says you need bristles. Right. <laughs> He would never, that would be absurd in that field. But There's in our, our, low our new t-shirt, science field, says bristles. <laughs> right? <laughs> in okay. our deeply, you know, underpaid, female-driven mm -hmm. in a patriarchal, misogynistic society, <laughs> um, we're not, we as a field aren't valued enough for anyone to even point out the absurdity of it in the way they would if we were doctors or dentists or right. lawyers or anyone else. Yeah, yeah. But it's crazy. And you know, I think some of it also comes from our own internal teacher scripts, which we don't always question and examine unless someone says, here's a different way to think about it. You know, I think about when I first started doing the work, I was 19, I didn't know child development was something you could learn about. I didn't know early childhood what education was a major. You could, you know, I just, I right. just knew. I, you know, I like kids. I'm good with kids. Right. Um, and so my first lead teacher job was with a group of two-year-olds. And the script that I went to was my elementary school memories and my memories of playing school. And that was, that was my learning script or my teaching script. So that's what I tried to make it look like was that I'm the teacher and you're the participants and I lead everything and I plan everything. And it took me, you know, a couple of years to get of seeing some different things and, and reading different ways of thinking about it before I, I, I sort of started to do it differently. So I, I, you know, again, and I don't think you're saying this either, Richard, we're not in, I don't assigning evil intent or, um, oh. or, you know, thinking teachers who follow these other scripts are, are bad people who are harming children right but we do have this responsibility to understand the age groups that we're with the real science about what's happening um not just looking at stuff like well this um this uh literacy curriculum package says it's evidence-based that children will be doing sight words by whatever okay right. so the evidence says that this can get you from A to B, but does it tell you that B is the right thing we should be aiming for? Um, and we, so, so we need to develop some critical thinking. We need to, if we're not receiving that information from other people, we need to be going out and looking for it. It's everywhere. It's out there. Um, can I put you on the spot and ask you, sure. if we have for, for, for any listeners who aren't as practiced at thinking abstractly as, <laughs> as you are, um, could you, Give a specific example of what A and B, what that would look like in early childhood education. You said, um, we we look at these activities that say, if you do this, you can get from A to B. Sure. What does that mean in a more practical way? Um, well, so specifically, I think about, you know, just what, what I said, the literacy packages that you can buy. Right. And, or the handwriting packages of curriculum packages you can buy that say, if you just... Um, keep doing this activity or these activities that you'll have a child who can write their name when they're three instead of thinking about should, um, they, be? should they be is that really something it's cool if it if, if your kid is three and wants to write their name and practices and gets it but to have that as a standard goal for a whole group of children from 36 months to 47 months um, or even, you know, four and five, whatever those months are to have that as your goal for, as a standard for a whole group does not line up with, um, 
a developmentally appropriate fine motor expectation for a three-year-old. Like we, we have to look at, um, we have to educate ourselves about what are the foundational things for holding a pencil. Um, and you know, it's squeezing Play-Doh and it's climbing. And it's, it's all those other things. It's, it's core strength because we got to have the core strength before we can expect finger strength. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm reminded of Bed Boss. Yeah. You know, who used to talk about calendar, right? And she yeah. would say, we spend a half an hour on it every morning, ages three, four, and five. But we know that once they're eight, they'll understand the abstract concept of calendar within five minutes. Yeah, exactly. So do we really need to be shackled by these developmental milestones and the related activities that say do this at two so that they can do this at three so that yeah. they can do this in four at four etc when all of those things will be accomplished quickly and without stress at six right right i'm kind of coming back to what you said like just because they can does that mean they should mm -hmm. or that well, it's a good really. thing or that it's a lasting skill that will go with them yeah is Maybe it not. where we should be putting our energies right because they could does that mean that's what we should be prioritizing yeah yeah and, and so to me part of the problem is that we have a we attract a deeply disempowered you know for the amount we pay and the educational levels that we um embrace uh -huh. we attract we tend to attract really disempowered human beings yeah. uh, into our field who um who aren't likely to make waves mm -hmm. um and so because in order to well, question the values of early that we find in early childhood education, you have to question the values of our greater educational system. Mm, and that's big. The values of our greater educational system, you almost have to question the entire American culture. <laughs> yeah. That's what they're being prepared for. So when you start going up against that, it's like, I can't just yeah. to, you know, bite off this one piece. Yeah. Because it's so deeply connected to these but you can deeply rooted pieces. You can just bite off one piece. You wow. can just say, I'm uncomfortable with expecting all my three-year-olds to write all the letters of the alphabet um, by the end of this school year, quote unquote. Um, you can say, I'm going to do other things to get their fingers ready and get the strength built up to meet that. Um, but you have to then figure out how to tie it in to that standard. So, and so maybe I'm talking myself into circles. Piece. Yeah, I'm sorry, what? I said I'm talking in circles now, oh. but yeah, parent education too. We have to, um, I think that's one of the biggest ways that we could make the change in the field and in educational policy is to get families with young children um, to start thinking about things in new ways and realize that that educational toy marketing and the messages they've been hearing since before they had children are maybe not um, what should be guiding <laughs> or, right. or the only way learning happens is if there's a, a label on the box that says, it says educational toy. I think we can really empower parents to sort of, and I think for a lot of them, that's following the instinct they already have that they've been quashing because of the societal right. messages. Right. For some, not for all. Oh. But I, I mean, I think that's our I think that's one of our powers is that parent education piece. Uh, yes, I agree 100 percent. And yeah, um, you know, you and I just the other day were talking about uh, the possible value of introducing parents to schema play mm -hmm. as a way of expanding their perceptions of what's best for their young children. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And. It's a lovely, powerful idea, <laughs> right? No disagreement yeah. for me there. Yeah. But it exists within the context of an American culture in which parents, sometimes before their child is even born, yeah. are, are enculturated and habituated to, to go, 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 exceed, accomplish. That's what my children need. My child's older sibling is in third grade and um, he's struggling. So yeah. I need to get my child prepared now yeah. so that this next child will flourish in third grade. 
And I hear what you're saying about squishing Play-Doh, but I need my child writing their name. Yeah. So, so you have a teacher has all that parent parental thinking, familial thinking right. to, to contend with. And so my, that, my that sounds very defeatist program, though, Richard, that sounds like again. you're saying, it sounds very defeatist. It sounds like you're saying the larger cultural issue is so big that the small changes we try to make aren't, aren't valuable. Uh, I'm saying I'm, uh, in my belief, I'm being realistic, uh -huh. being realist in saying that, okay, if we're going to take that on, we need to be, you know, crystal clear uh -huh. about what we're up against here. Sure. So, Okay. I wasn't trying to be defeatist, but I was trying to just lay out really clearly for maybe for people who have never thought about it. Yeah. The opposition they're going to get and all the layers of cultural layers that mm -hmm. undergird what otherwise appears to be a simple surface thing, like what I want for my young child. Right. But it's so much bigger than that. And if you don't get to those other things, I'm, you won't get lasting buy-in. So, my... so this is rapidly turning into a working with families episode but i mean i think this is where interesting re yeah relationships come into play right because if yep. we if we're working on those really authentic connected relationships with families i mean we have to do it with children of course but with families then we'll have a little bit more influence we'll be able to know how to present it to different families um and it's a you know, so it's not me and my classroom changing the whole world, but maybe it's me and my classroom impacting the way four of my 10 sets of parents think about what's happening with their right. child here. 100%. Yeah. Okay. So I want to, um, so I do want to move to the, to the assessment part of the conversation you mentioned earlier that um we don't individualize like or you know our our systems aren't set up for individualizing right. and you know we talked about how observing can be part of the planning process um so what what i thought when i was reading that um uh, i gotta get to that part of the quote hold on give me a second to flip this page it takes effort um, it says we're instructed to use assessments again, because people want that measurable piece. So when we're talking men about people. assessments, what men, people, men, people are the only ones who want measurable results. Well, primarily those in power. Yeah. Want yeah. those results are driven by uh, male values. Okay. And supported by all genders. <laughs> who who don't sort of I don't know how what I want to say there so I'm going to skip that part all right Just forget so, I said that right. anyway um I feel like when we have these assessment tools they could be used and when we're talking when I'm talking about an assessment tool I mean like a specific checklist um I know that's one tiny tiny piece of assessment but I think it's the easiest one to use okay because I've got 10 kids. I'm supposed to have developmental reports about each of them. I've got 20 kids, whatever. Um, the easiest way to do that is to set aside a day and mark off my checklist of what they can and can't do. And then the, we only really use that information to, to find deficits and kids who are quote unquote behind. Right. So I think it's a really limiting way of measuring what's happening with children or just making decisions about what we should do or offer or not do, but it's, it's the easiest. Um, uh, so I don't know, I guess what I want to, what I want to try and lead this into is what does authentic assessment look like? How, how, how can we use the information? How does that fit with what we were just talking about, about, curriculum planning and developmental outcomes. I'm just going to throw all that out and see if you have something to say. Well, I think it's difficult to embrace authentic assessment using the inauthentic tools yeah. that we're required to use. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I do a workshop. One of the webinars or workshops that I offer is about 
observing children and then what do we do with it? How do we use the stuff we get from the observation? Right. And part of what we talk about and what I talk about with my students um, at the college is that that checklist is a snapshot. And just because you don't see it in the hour that you've designated as my hour to observe um, this child doesn't mean they can't do it. Um, uh, but if we are just sort of consistently informally and formally observing, jotting down notes each day, if we see something a child's doing, jotting down questions we have about, here's what I see, I wonder if it means whatever. All of that over time, you can do a little bit each day for each child. And then over time, you can put that all together if you're required to do that checklist and you'll get a much more accurate idea as you go back and look at all your notes. So I think that's one, one thing that's a manageable step to make the, the required checklists closer to an authentic picture of what the child really um, right. is, is doing and being and wondering and all that stuff. So let's just take that example. So mm -hmm. then what are some things that are necessary in order to do just that, right? Mm -hmm. So first of all, uh, teachers need to be trained to understand and practice skill and gain skills in doing what you just described because mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily come natural to anyone. Right. And then there has to be time built into the schedule uh, uh, for them to do that, for, for them to make the observations, write down their observations mm -hmm. and later go back and look for patterns, reflect on them and find mm -hmm. something and find valuable data in them. Mm -hmm. So, um, we're challenged in all of those ways already, right? Right, right. We have too many kids with one teacher. Schedules are too packed. You know, in my last job as a director, man, I I, I went in going, I am going to value that teacher planning time every day. They're so, it's so important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by day two, people were getting sick. Life was happening. Traumas were going on in people's lives. Yeah. So they had to cover other rooms. And I could never figure out how to make it happen mm -hmm. to value that at, at the moment that something happens, that's the first thing that gets taken away from teachers. Right. And right. even with someone like me, who's got a, a certain level of skill in this area, um, I couldn't, I couldn't overcome it. Mm -hmm. Just the, the practical needs to make what you just described happen. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think I, um, I, I think it's possible yes. to to do some of that, even with the time constraints we have. I think part of it is just um, developing the habit and not worrying about what you're writing at first, just writing. Um, but I always had index cards in my pockets and little clipboards in four or five parts around the room and um, post-it notes um, everywhere. Right. So that in the mo I don't have to take any moment, any time away and say, um, can you handle the whole group? Because I'm going to sit back and observe for an hour. Right. I, I didn't have to do that. I could just in the moment, jot it down. And at the end of the day, sort of put those post-its and index cards. I had one time a shoe, like a shoe rack, shoe bag that hangs over the door with a, a child's name on each of those pockets. And I would throw all those observations in there. Right. Um, but now, but now I've it... got to do something with it. Right. And and that's where it gets tricky. I think so that's where the, it gets more difficult to, to manage. Agreed. And and again, just going back to my last job as a director, the way that looked in 2021 or whatever was um, most teachers had Chromebooks sure. and they were all open to TS Gold. Mm -hmm. And so as they observed things, they checked off boxes in TS Gold. Mm -hmm. And TS Gold kind of sort of you know, we've organized all this for you, so you don't have to think it through. Yeah. <laughs> and so that piece that was so important to you and I, which was pouring over all that information, looking for patterns, coming to realizations, uh -huh. um, that's, that was missing for my yeah. last group of teachers. Yeah. Because theoretically, TS Gold does it for you. Yeah. Well, so if we're looking at, at our goals, if our goal is just to fill out TS Gold, so that um, the system says I'm up to date 
right. on my observations. That's one thing. But if my goal is to find information that I can use to support children, um, I mean, I think, I don't know that it would take, how do I want to say this? Again, it's a habit. It doesn't happen just all at once. Right. But still having that that system of lots of different ways to take notes throughout the day. Um, I don't think that's much more of a time suck than having your Chromebook open all the time and being having to run back to that. But it could still be used. And so you're doing all these little notes in the moment. Um, it, for one thing, I think it helps us keep those things in mind. And so it could still be entered pretty easily into TS gold, right. um, uh, a couple times a day, you could still visit, you know, or whatever your system is. Um, but it develops a habit of being aware so that it becomes more natural for us to notice those things. And it's like a physical physical reminder to use that information again and not just stop when it's entered on the the computer so that was me just sort of thinking through how how the systems could be it could be both and and not either or richard sorry how dare you that was menomena my ringtone (laughs) So, yeah, yeah. So anyway, there's what I have to say about that. Well, I mean, I, you know, <laughs> to me, what you said is reasonable, Yeah. you know, because it harkens back to my history. And I know that I was able to do it back then. But I also know that the world is different. The demographics of our field are different. The training they receive is different. Mm-hmm. I ended up and had to hire so many people in that last director job. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was thrilled when they could embrace singing out loud with kids. Yeah. And, uh, you know, um, getting down on their level mm-hmm. and, you know, um, doing the fun parts of the job. Right. Um, but to ask these people to do the the more higher level abstract parts of their job, like gathering data and then and then reviewing it and look, mm-hmm. you know, that's um it's a big ask yeah. for, for so for such a little return for some of these folks. Mm-hmm. Um, I agree that it's necessary. I don't know how to pull it off logistically. Yeah. Um, now we've come away from the actual quote a little bit here in what we're focusing on. Yeah. It's great. I just want to point that out. Sure. Well, bring it back. Well, <laughs> So they th- that quote was talking about something that I've heard you talk about a lot, which is, <clears throat> or one of the things that it touched on, is which is that developmental milestones are misused mm-hmm. uh, as um, that when someone that when a child doesn't meet the developmental milestone, it means there's something wrong with them. Mm-hmm. The, the developmental milestones are not used to track development. They're used to like score it. And if you don't get to that, you're some, you as a child are somehow failing or behind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is a reflection of our elementary school ed- uh, system, but it, 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 uh, it doesn't work in our world of early childhood. Yeah. I'm yeah. trying to find, trying to find the other quote from that you're reminding me of from this, but I'll just have to sum it up. Okay. Here. Huh? All right, I can read it. Uh, no, a, a different one. Oh, oh I, I have see. a different quote, but um, there's another spot in the book where he talks about what we what we look at as developmental outcomes and what we assume we are teaching when we when we plan these activities and then try to measure the developmental outcome is just child development happening that happening naturally and maturation. Right. And, you know, we just happen to have this activity that might fit, but it's more likely that it's just the child finally got to that stage of maturity or, or growth right. along their natural trajectory. And we're just taking credit for it because we offered an activity. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, so I think, I don't know. I think that I, that's just what you, what you were talking about reminded me of that piece where he had, where he had said that. So what are we going to do about this messed up field? Heather well, 
I am sounding defeatist. Well, so I'm, I mean, I think that you're right. The, the whole overall system, our overall educational system, especially in the United States, um, impacts disproportionately <laughs> what we're doing in, with young children in these, in these settings that we've got them, um, whether it's a child care center or a half day preschool or a family child care home, whatever it is, we're feeling this pressure that starts with that system, which, and that system comes from our, um, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, rugged individualism, yeah. uh, uh, yeah, everything existed. everything I earned is my own merit and not any way affected by interdependency um and, and so yeah if you look at it that way then why should I try why why should I try to fix any of these little things but if we look at it from you know I think it's Margaret Mead who said something like you know never doubt that a small group of people can change the world in fact that's the only thing that ever has changed the world the actions of a small group of people um that's really where i come from with this is if if this podcast can get um you know a small group here and a small group there and one person over here um to think about this in a different way and to try to expand um either you know validate their practices and give them the stamina to keep doing it even though it feels really hard um or Oh yeah, I've never thought of it that way. Or oh, I I definitely need to learn more about I want to start practicing keeping those little notes or whatever. Whatever that little thing is that that small group or person does, I feel like is worth the effort. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um but just to I'm very preachy today. <laughs> is that why I feel like saying hallelujah, amen? I don't know. No, it's probably not. Um, why. <laughs> hallelujah, amen. No, I'm with you. But just to paint an even more kind of uh, dire picture, yeah, bring um, us down, Richard. <laughs> of what we're against, you know, yeah. those standards and those methodologies and everything we've been talking about existed pre-COVID. Yes. So now here we are, two and a half, coming on three years into a pandemic. Uh huh. We don't even have all the research, but we have enough anecdotal evidence from our field to show that our children have regressed. Mm -hmm. They've lost time. The children, the young children in our care mm -hmm. have shown regression in their development. Mm -hmm. They've shown um, uh, delays in their in a lot of areas of development. And yet those standards stay the same. Right. And so one would guess that there will be, at least in the short term, higher sort of quote unquote failure rates. Right. Oh, we're already talking about the person. terrible learning loss of COVID and all right. that stuff. Yeah. Right. But it doesn't, we can talk about it, but it doesn't impact the day-to-day -day life of our professionals, of our teachers and caregivers. It doesn't give them any further guidance or context. They're still plugging along, trying to get their children to reach goals by giving them activities mm -hmm. um, that were already not going to work. And now, you know, they're set up for even greater senses of failure mm -hmm. when, when that was never the nature of our field to begin with. Right. If we could just build relationships with love and care for, play with children, give them materials, time, and equipment to, to um, spark their curiosities um, everything they need to thrive in kindergarten and beyond is there. Right. As long as we're not distracted from what we think are, from what society tells us should be our goals for them right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We already should have taken a step back and said, no, this isn't working. And now the, the problems with the current system are even louder. Right. But we still keep walking forward. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, so what I would, I guess what I would add to just yeah. an attempt to appear positive. Yeah. Um, no. Um, Please try. Build on, on, on the positivity <laughs> that you put out there. You know, so. um, my hope for your listeners is that in addition to gaining helpful information 
from podcasts like this. And you use the word validation as well, but a sense of empowerment. Mm -hmm. It's okay to speak up. It's okay to say to your boss, here's what I think we could be doing. Mm -hmm. um, here's what you, you know, there were things that I said to our licensor when I was a director that never should have worked. Um, yeah. But with persistence and with kind of skillful communication, uh -huh. um, even some of those licensors can move. So I guess I want your listeners to know that if you're coming away from this podcast feeling defeated or frustrated, okay, but now <laughs> what are you going to do about now it? What? Yeah, now exactly. what? Yeah, exactly. And um, if you're feeling that you don't have any power in this world, um, that will keep you from getting to the now what? Uh -huh. If you believe you have a little bit of power and that you're part of a larger collective, speak up. Mm -hmm. And you may find that you can make changes um, that that you didn't that your mind told you weren't possible when you were staying silent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I think it it's good for you know even our I'll say even our mental health to feel like it's not all just being put upon me, and that's the end. Like it's put upon me, but I can make some you know even just small little actions um give me that that feeling like i still have some agency i still um it's still worth it to be in this job it's still worth it to be trying um as hard as i try um it's still well, worth it to have that conversation with my co-teacher or the parent yes yeah yeah i'll point out one uh way of being or way of thinking that you and i have mentioned to each other the other day that we have in common uh -huh. that isn't you know is is not typical in our <laughs> you know again our educational system is about churning out factory workers right. yeah and so the idea of thinking critically and being creative in your problem solving is not what we're enculturated to do right but one of the things that you and i said that we have in common is that we tend to ask for forgiveness instead of permission <laughs> That's right. I was waiting for you to say, because I couldn't remember what you were building to, but yes. Yeah. And, and I'll just say to anyone who's listening, um, that has bit me in the ass more than a few times mm -hmm. across my whatever, 40 years. Yeah. But um, more often than not, um, it has given me those tiny little inroads to make those tiny differences Yeah. Um, that I wouldn't ever have been able to make if I had just been waiting for permission. Yeah. And yeah. I, we need people in this field who are rebellious and who are willing to go, no, you know what? I don't, I don't need to pour tea into the Boston Harbor. <laughs> I, I can just give them more time to play. Sure. And I can interpret some of these things, these standards that are required of me in a way that makes sense. Yeah. And yeah. And I've I'll been saying trouble for it. I'll just be, oops. Yeah. I'm sorry. Moving yeah. Forward, I'll do it the other way. Yeah, I've been saying, and I even before COVID, when people would say, well, I don't want to get fired. It's like, right. It's hard to get fired in a child care job because no one wants to rehire and the turnover. Is, but especially now that there's this huge shortage, I feel like there's this opportunity <laughs> that we can rebel a little bit more and not worry about getting fired because there's no one else who wants to come in and do my job. So they can, well, they're going to keep me. <laughs> And also to point out, though, that, you but know, don't our, go and say Heather said you could do whatever you want. Uh, no, and you wouldn't go and say Heather said you can do whatever you want. <laughs> they can't fire Heather. That's true. Blame it That's on true. Heather. And if they sure. say you can be listening to Heather, just go, oh, I'm sorry. Right. OK, I learned I shouldn't be listening to Heather and then mm -hmm. go back and listen to Heather more secretly. <laughs> That's how to get through life. Right. Um, yes. More people should subscribe to that. My entire marriage is still standing because I've listened to Heather. No, <laughs> no, that's not true. Yeah, I know that's not true. Yeah, no. <laughs> but, anyway, um, we've slid into the we should be done, but now we're just being ridiculous. And how do we wrap this up part of the podcast? <laughs> oh, I started there, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I feel, I mean, I feel like that's a good place to start. Not so much maybe my advice, but your, um, your advice about. No, um, your advice too. Uh, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission kind of kind of thing what were you gonna say say it what
I, I would just point out that our ability, our, our ability to um, live by that code of asking for forgiveness than permission has a lot of privilege in it. Yeah, that's true. Um, that the majority of people in our field lack the privilege we have um, because of their race, their culture, mm -hmm. their gender, That's their true. socioeconomic levels. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people have spent their whole lives not thinking further than what do I need to do to get this paycheck, to pay those bills and get the dinner on my table. Mm -hmm. And our ability to sit here and think about these abstract ideas or to take risks of permission, um, at least I, I can speak for me. I, I'm I'm able to see that they're rooted in my white male privilege, mm. and that not everyone is able to jump into that head first as right. I right, right. Well, I'll I'll just add this one piece that I learned when I was working in a center where um, my philosophy did not match their philosophy, but I had to have the job. Um, I I could do the morning expectations, and not you know, not harm the children. We could do those activities. We could go through those motions. But I asked to be, because most most of the time here anywhere, anyway, lead teachers are like the seven to four, that, that prime early shift and you get right. off early. I worked nine to six so that I had everything from 1130 after to do whatever I wanted and however I wanted it because people aren't as concerned about that part of the day. They're mm. concerned about nine to 11 when we're talking about these academic expectations and stuff. Yes. Indeed. There's a, a life hack for you. <laughs> 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 all right. Now we can wrap up the episode. Um, all right. Thanks, Richard. This was fun. It was good. Um, yeah, I hope it was bad. Uh, yeah, I definitely was was thinking differently about some things and yeah. um, hopefully listeners will too. So, so thank you. All right. And thank you everybody for listening. Um, I hope you'll come back for another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. Bye. Bye.